Right, we're back on air. Welcome once again to Once Upon a Time in the Ashes, the podcast that shuns the titans of Ashes cricket for the less heralded heroes of Anglo and Tipperdean rivalry. Well, until today, that is. We interrupt your regular scheduled programming to bring you a bonus extra special episode of Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. We'll be back on the trail of our One Ashes Test Wonders next time around. But today, the floor belongs to Ian Michael Chappell. Chapelli to his friends and foes, Australian cricket legend and one of the finest captains the game has seen. We've been grateful for his contributions to previous episodes, but now it's time for some unadulterated Chapelli. And thankfully for you and I, he ignored the advice he received in 1968. Bob Parrish, we called him Bob the Snob. He was our manager. He was very rarely in the bar, but he happened to be in the bar that night. And I must have been holding court. And if I'm holding court, I'm, there's usually a fair bit of swearing going on. Mm-hmm. And Bob suddenly out of the blue said, Ian, if you want to captain Australia, you better cut down on your bad language. And I said, well, Bob, I've been swearing most of my life, so I'm probably not going to change. Ian Chappell played in 75 tests for Australia, scoring 5,345 runs at 42.42 with 14 hundreds. He made his test debut against Pakistan in 1964 and his final test was against England in 1980. That was in a a non-Ashes test. He was made Australia Test Cricket Captain for the seventh test of the 1970-71 Ashes where he captained our two previous One Ashes Test Wonders, Ken Eastwood and our inspirational Vietnam War veteran, Tony Dell. He then resigned the captaincy four and a half years later at the end of the 1975 Ashes series at the Oval. In 30 matches as captain, he won 15 tests, losing only five. Following that final Ashes Test in 1971, he led Australia in seven series, winning five and drawing two. No Australian Test captain since has managed to stay in the job without losing a series. And he led by example, as well as through his famous aggressive captaincy, averaging exactly 50 when skippering the side. Leadership was clearly in his genes. His maternal grandfather, Vic Richardson, captained Australia in five tests against South Africa in 1935-36. to And of course, his brother Greg would take over the Test captaincy from him. So where to begin? At the Adelaide Oval or the MCG, Lords or the Oval? Better still, how about Acre Bottom in the Lancashire League? Rams Bottom in 1963. Was that a good season for you? The Lancashire League became popular for improving Australian cricketers after Bob Simpson came back. Because Simpson, I think, got nine or 11 half centuries on the trot. I think it was Accrington. He then came back to Australia and made a pile of runs. At one stage, I think he was averaging 1,000. I think he got a 300 not out. And a, yeah. He said, oh, I was playing in the Lancashire League that improved my cricket. So when I came back, oh, you know, what did Lancashire League do for your cricket? And I said, it, it improved my drinking and my swearing and put my cricket back about six months. <laughs> it, was a, it was a terrible summer, you know, apart from the professional and maybe one or two odd players in the team, the cricket's bloody, you know, <laughs> zed growth. I'm afraid I didn't agree with Bob Simpson that it improved your cricket. But I'll say this, I had a really good time. I enjoyed the people. And every time I go back to Lancashire, I feel like it's my second home. They're very, very good people. And I see having put up with the weather, I can see why they've got a good sense of humour. The other thing that was interesting was you got, and there was one bloke in particular at Ramsbottom, you know, he just said, worst pro of all time. And then the boys said to me, don't worry about that, because he he says that about every pro we've had. But it was interesting, um, when I went back in 72 as captain, there was a big photo in the newspaper, former Ramsbottom pro, uh, captain of Australia. So suddenly, you know, I was a hero of Ramsbottom. But, yeah. but they were good guys and uh, I had a good time, but uh, didn't yeah. help my cricket, mate. Well, yeah, let, let's move on to a slightly higher standard of cricket. 
64, you made your test debut. What do you remember of that? Proud moment? Oh, yeah. I probably wasn't ready mentally, I don't think. My first Shield 100 was against New South Wales, which was basically the test attack. It was Davidson, Misson, Benno, Martin, you know, so they'd all played test cricket. I guess what that did, you sort of thought, well, I've made runs against test match bowlers. Maybe I've got a chance. But I still don't think I was mentally ready at that point. You get picked and that means you've got a chance of staying there. By the time I got picked again to play against England 65-6, I think I was, by that stage, I was mentally ready. What was it like back then? Obviously, there's a lot of hype around the Ashes uh, nowadays and every series that comes up, there's a lot of hullabaloo. Was it still the same back then? Was that the series that you really wanted to play in and the opposition you wanted to play against? Oh, Jesus, I just wanted to play for Australia. And, and you're right, the, uh, hullabaloo is probably the right word. And uh, there's a lot of bullshit spoken about <laughs> uh, the baggy green, most of the bullshit's about the baggy green. But, yes, about the Ashes as well. But if you sort of say, oh, you know, the Ashes is it, well, so what approach do you take when you play against the West Indies or mm. Pakistan? As far as I was concerned, every test series was bloody important. It's a disgrace that cricket's allowed the West Indies to fall by the wayside. There's only four big draw cards in mm. world cricket. England, Australia, India and the West Indies. Yeah, I mean, the West Indies, when they were at their even before they were at their peak, you, you think back to Frank Worrell's team. That was the world record crowd. I'm not sure. I think it's been surpassed now. I'm not sure. There was 100,000 people turned out in Melbourne to farewell the West Indies. So even before they were at their peak, they were a, they were a big draw cut. And mm. to let them fall by the wayside, is, is that's a black mark against cricket. OK, so, yeah, your first Ashes test came 65, 66. I guess it was really 68. Would you say that was fair that you really came into your own? Yeah, getting 100 against India in 67, 8. You know, once, once you get that first test 100, that's when you start to think, OK, I'm good enough to play at this level. You sort of feel like you're part of the team. I got in a bit of a tangle before we went to England in 68. Yeah, I sort of felt, even though I'd got my first Test 100, I didn't do much outside of that. I still felt like the last Shield game of the season, I needed a couple of decent scores to make sure that I was in the team. And I bloody ran myself out at the MCG. And I remember they were knocking the main pavilion down. And so we were changing in the old grandstand. They had to lock the door for security so when I got to the door after having run myself out and I was, I think I, I got 40 and 60. I can't remember which innings I got what, but both innings I was going well and did something stupid and got out. And I was really pissed off with myself. And I remember sitting on the steps while I was waiting for the 12th man to come and open the door. I sort of made this decision. I thought, right, if I get picked to go to England, I'm going to relax and I'm going to enjoy myself. I suddenly relaxed a lot more about international cricket and I think that was that was an important decision that I made on the steps at the MCG then I got runs in that first test again I got run out and Paul Sheehan ran me out in that game for 70 odd I think there was a big partnership between Bill and Dougie uh, they got 80 odd each I reckon and then um, and then we lost those two got out and we might have lost another wicket so it was, I got those runs at a critical time. That definitely helped a lot, confidence-wise. But yeah, 68 was, the Tour of England was definitely a turning point. It's interesting how putting things in context, because it's always been said that Doug Walters didn't do any good in England, which is not correct. He didn't make any hundreds in England, but his Tour of 68 and his Tour in 75 were good tours. 72, he had a dud tour and we had to drop him for the last test. But, you see, Doug was coming off a very high high base. You know, when he went to England in 68, his test average was probably, I don't know what it was, but it was probably 70. It was very high. And mine was nothing. I came back from England and everybody said what a good tour I'd had and what a dud tour Doug had had. 
Yes, Ian scored 348 runs at 43.5 in that 68 Ashes, compared to 343 runs at 38 for Doug Walters. Ian's top score was 81 in the second innings of the fourth test at Headingley. And in all first-class matches that summer, he scored 1,261 runs at 48.5, with three hundreds, including 202 against Warwickshire. His star was rising and the captaincy was starting to emerge on the horizon. One of the interesting things that happened on that 68 tour, we were in a hotel in Kent. Bob Parrish, we called him Bob the Snob. He was our manager (laughs) and he was very rarely in the bar, but he happened to be in the bar that night. And I must have been holding court. And if I'm holding court, there's usually a fair bit of swearing going on. Mm -hmm. And Bob suddenly out of the blue said, Ian, if you want to captain Australia, you better cut down on your bad language. And I said, well, Bob, I've been swearing most of my life. (laughs) So I'm probably not going to change. And I mean, that was a hell of a shock to me that he's suddenly this bored guy talking about me captaining Australia. I mean, Mm. and I'm thinking, where the hell has this come from? Other than, you know, my grandfather captain Australia. That's, that was the only thing I can think of. It absolutely staggered me that, that a board bloke and, and pretty high up the chain was sort of thinking about me captaining Australia. Because then you became South Australia captain in 7071, didn't you? I was vice captain of Australia before I was vice captain of South Australia. And in fact, I took over the vice captaincy from the South Australian vice captain, Barry <laughs> Jarman. When they dropped star from the, uh, the fifth test at the SCG and they made me vice captain, and when I got back to South Australia, Les Favell was the captain of South Australia. And Les said to me, he said, uh, yeah, fucking might be vice captain of Australia, son. He said, but when you're back here as vice captain, I'll be asking his opinion, not yours. And he pointed to Barry Jarman, you know, which that was, that was fine by me. I didn't, didn't bother me much. But then, yeah, I took over in 7071. I, I think I'd only captained... South Australia like five times before I captained Australia. Well, listen, the background to 7071, pretty crucial from your perspective, wasn't it? How you ended up being captain because it really came out of those India and South Africa tours and your unhappiness with conditions and pain, all the rest of it. Would that be fair? Yeah. The first time it really, that I was aware that there was a bit of a problem was right at the end of the 68 tour of England. There was always a dinner at the end of a tour you know, sort of a farewell dinner. The night of the farewell dinner, we were in the Waldorf bar, the drinkers, and Bob Cowper, who was, Bob, I always had a lot of time for, very good cricket brain. And if I needed to sort of know anything or talk about the game of cricket, I'd usually have a chat with the uh, Cowps. Anyhow, we're, we're all in this in the bar at the Waldorf and uh, Cowps is there. And he suddenly said, listen, you guys, none of you speak at the dinner before I speak. And I thought, "Mm, that's strange, because Cowps, you know, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing with Cowps. Anyhow, we get into the the team dinner, and before, even before Bill speaks, Bob suddenly gets up there, and Parrish was, Parrish may even have been chairman of the board by that stage, and maybe Bradman was still chairman of the border. It was right at the end, if, mm. if he still was, it was right at the end of his term and Parrish took over pretty soon after that. Anyhow, so Parrish is high up the chain. Cowps gets up and he pays out on the board big time. And, of course, when he got back to Australia, he retired. Mm-hmm. And he was, Cowps was only about 27, I think. And so that was the first time I really became aware that a few people were pissed off with right. uh, what was going on. Then throw forward to India, South Africa, things really started to blow up in India because there were some good hotels in India, but we weren't staying in them. For instance, at, in Bombay, as it was then, we stayed at the uh, CCI, at uh, Brabourne Stadium, and it was terrible. For the New Year's Eve night before we flew to South Africa, they put us up in the Taj Mahal, which was mm. a bloody nice hotel. Yeah. Delhi, we used to go and drink at the at the Oberoi, there were two Oberois. There was an old one and a new one. We were staying in the old one. So we were pissed off with that. Then somebody, I think it was Ian Redpath, found out that if if one of us died on the tour, 
the wife would get, it was either $400 or $1,200. I can't remember what, but it wasn't very much. Then we got to Gahadi and Gahadi was terrible, bloody awful. The bloody idiot manager we had, Fred Bennett, got up and made a speech in Gahadi and he said, what we're all looking forward to is coming back to Gahati when they have their first test match here. And 16 voices from the floor said, bullshit, it was in Gohati where Bill had the players only meeting and said, righto, what are your complaints? And everybody had their complaints and Bill wrote them all down. And that's when I went to him after that meeting and I said, Bill, we all need to sign that letter because mm-hmm. we all believe that it's crap. And I said, if you just sign it on your own, you know what the board are like? I said, mate, they'll wait for you to fail a couple of times. Boom, you'll be gone. And guess what happened? That's exactly what happened. The other thing that really pissed us off, somebody back in, a journalist in Australia asked Bradman why Greg wasn't on the tour. And Bradman's answer, and of course, we would get it three or four days later when the mail arrived. And Bradman's answer was, oh, he's better off being in Australia, making Sheffield Shield runs and not getting crook in India. And of course, we all said, well, so what? That doesn't matter a fuck if we get crook. You know, it was a stupid bloody answer. So all these things were building up. Anyhow, as you know, Bill wrote the letter to the board and signed it himself. And a few months later, he was gone. Then South Africa, and I mean, that again, we were, we were sold up the river by the board again. The original tour was India and Pakistan, which, which would have been tough, but the conditions in Pakistan are reasonably similar to India. Yeah. So not such a big transition. You go from three months of playing on tracks that are turning like that mm. and all you're doing is facing spinners and, you know, as a right-hand bats and I'm hitting with the spin like this through mid-wicket, we go to South Africa and it's green tops and all seamers and I'm fucking still square on and trying to hit through mid-wicket. And, and the reason was... Pakistan wouldn't pay the money because in those days it was a guarantee system. Pakistan wouldn't pay the money. They would only pay their own currency and Australia wanted hard currency. So they said no and South Africa jumped in and obviously South Africa guaranteed them money and bugger the players, off we go to South Africa. Bill Laurie, who didn't have seven pounds to lose, he lost seven pounds in weight in India. Graham McKenzie was stuffed. He got something wrong with him. And in 66, Graham McKenzie was, was our bloody attack in South Africa. It took 32 wickets, I think, in South Africa. So mm. he's gone. They were a better team than us, but they were never a 4-0 better side than us. You know, we got sold up the river. I mean, it was still bubbling from India, but then it really blew up. We were in Johannesburg. Because the South Africans started winning and you know what they're like, they bloody love winning. So they suddenly decide, oh, you yeah, know, this is good. We'll have a fifth test and we'll have it in Joburg and we'll get more money. And But this is where the board made a mistake because, and this is how smart cricket administrators are, after the fourth test, which was the last test, we had to play in Bloemfontein and Cape Town, first-class games. I mean, fuck me, we've been away for yeah. five and a half months. Fourth <laughs> test finishes. No, no, we're not flying home. We're playing Western Province and fucking whoever, Orange Free State. Once South Africans decided that they wanted to have a fifth test and they must have again offered money to the board because Fred Bennett was keen to, for it to happen. But their problem was to play the test match it went three days longer than what we'd already signed on for. But they had to do a new contract. And that's when I said to the blokes, fuck the board. We're not going to have an opportunity, another opportunity like this. We've got them over a barrel. Let's just say, mate, up you. When you start treating us properly, we'll start to treat you properly. And But some of them wanted the money. And then what happened they, I think they offered 200, which was a test match fee in those days, $200. And some of the guys said, no, nah, no, nah, we want more than that. And then the Wanderers Club, I think, offered to boost it to 500. Bill said before we went into the meeting, the last meeting, 
it's all in or all out. I know Graham McKenzie was, he was going to say no. I think Dougie was another one who was going to say no. Brian Tabor had told me that he said, mate, if I have to vote, I'll vote no, but I'd prefer not to because he'd just started a new job with the Rothman Sports Foundation who were sort of associated with the board. And he said, I'd prefer not to, but if it's looking desperate, I'll vote no. It was at that meeting where somebody said, oh, shit, we need the money. And I threw my checkbook on the table and said, if you need the money that badly, I'll write you a check. Let's not let this opportunity escape us, you know. Yeah, Um, yeah, this is the moment kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. McGilvray told me that somebody from the board, and I would say probably Tim Corbell, he was mates with Tim Corbell, had told him that I'd never captain Australia. Mm. So that that would have been... April, May, 1970. So that bloke obviously didn't have as much uh, say as he thought he did. So that was, yeah, that was less than a year. You were Australian captain. Yeah. Well, Richie Benno had the black cross against his name as well. Never to captain Australia. And uh, so <laughs> they did put a black cross against a few guys' names. Yeah, yeah. So just before we get to that uh, seventh test, obviously yeah. Greg made his debut uh, in Perth, second test. How great was that to, to be playing with your brother after all the, the tussles you'd had growing up? Yeah, it's interesting to go back to when he first came into the South Australian side and bear in mind that he played when I was in South Africa. So I missed his first season. Then when we batted together and I would have been batting three and Greg six. So we didn't bat together a lot, but we had a couple of mix-ups running between weeks. So I don't think anyone got run out, but we had a couple of mix-ups. And somebody wrote that you wouldn't know these two are brothers because they have got no understanding when they run between wickets. What he didn't understand was that we'd always been opponents. I think we might have played two club games together, something like that. It was not much more than that. So we'd always been against each other in the backyard. So there was no basis there for us to have this good understanding. It's not like we were twins who got this, what is it, telepathic stuff. You know, we're we're nearly five years apart. So Greg comes into the test side. That was getting the captaincy and Greg's 100 on debut are probably the two best things that that happened to me because I was really just jogging along at that point. The cricket was boring me because we were playing crap cricket. We were trying to get into a position where we couldn't lose before we started trying to win. I remember 68 at uh, Headingley. We didn't try and win. Again, we tried to get to a point where England couldn't win it. And then we brought Johnny Gleeson on and the the track was spinning. Now, I don't know that we we would have won it anyhow, but we bowled Connolly and McKenzie till the cows came home. Bill was injured. Barry Jarman was captain, but Bill Bill was running the show from the balcony. And now when we got in the dressing room, they had those bloody metal brown built lockers at, at uh, Headingley. And I, when I got in there, I threw my cap in the locker and said something like, oh, fuck this. What's this all about? You know, and I suddenly get this bloody heavy hand on my shoulder and I turn around and it's Bill. And I thought, well, well this is interesting. And yeah, Bill said, what's your problem? And I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm in this far. I might as well go. I said, mate, that was shit. We didn't try and win that we could have won that test we didn't try and win till it was too late and he said well we've done what we set out to do and I said what's that and he said "Uh, we've we've kept the ashes and I said well if that's what the ashes does to the game of cricket they should fuck them off straight away as I say I was getting a bit bored with the way we were playing and you know as I say I was just jogging along in my mind it was something I probably rationalised later rather than at that point. Anyhow, suddenly Greg comes into the test side and he makes 100 on debut. And I'm now thinking, Jesus Christ, if I don't get off my ass, I'm going to get replaced by my brother here. That was the first thing. And then not long after that, getting the captaincy, I think those two things were the spurs that really got me going and got me playing at my best. So I guess it was weird taking over from Bill because on one hand... I presume, you tell me otherwise, you respected him for the stance he took India, South Africa. But then from a cricketing perspective, you thought, look, mate, you're really not maybe being as aggressive as I would be in the captaincy. Well, 
a couple of things. I learned a lot about captaincy from Bill Laurie. I had a lot of respect for Bill as a player. I haven't played with too many, if any, that were gutsier than Bill. And the reputation of him being a slow player is overplayed to buggery. I batted a lot with Bill and he was, he was very good to bat with because you always got plenty of strike because he was a terrific runner between wickets. He was always pushing singles. So you, you were never stuck at the other end for ages, which is, which is a good thing. And Bill and I, even though we're totally different in personality, we've always got on okay. We've always got on, and particularly once we commentated together, we've got on very well mm. because we both knew where each other stood. Bill tells you what he's thinking. I tell you what I'm thinking. So, you know, I can deal with that. And I said to Bill that first test when I was vice captain at Sydney against the West Indies. And we were 350 in front. They were eight down. I think they had Charlie Griffiths and Gibbsy to come. And drinks come out and Bill comes over to me. So this is my first chance to offer some advice. And Bill says, what do you think? And I said, what do I think, mate? I said, we get two wickets quick as we can and we send them back in. He said, no, I'm going to, when we bowl them out, he said, I'm going to bat again and I'm going to give them 900 to get in a day and a half. And I said to him, Bill, if that's what you're going to do, I said, we obviously think poles apart on the game of cricket. It's mm. probably not much point in you asking for my advice anymore. And he never did. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there's respect there. My main gripe was the way they did it. Now, Bill, Bill had given tremendous service to Australia and he deserved to be told face to face. I don't think he should have been dropped as a batsman, still our best opening batsman. But it was the right move, I think, to, to move him on from the captaincy. But he should have been told face to face because the service he'd given Australia, he deserved that. You've got to respect those sort of things. And for him to hear it from Stacky, who heard it on the radio, was a disgrace. And that's when I, you know, when I got home that night, I said to my first wife, Kay, I said, the bastards will never get me that way. And so that was a part of the motivation mm. with the captaincy that I thought, right, I'm, I'm not going to stuff this up because I'm going to go out on my terms, not on their terms. So when you got to the ground that day, were you really thinking, look, I want to make a statement as captain here? And obviously you famously put England in and bowled them out. Was that a big part of your thinking or did you just take the day as it came? No, it was, it was all to do with the weather. There'd been a lot of rain for quite a few days. So not only had the pitch been under covers for quite a long time, but also the outfield was very heavy. And in Sydney, the outfield can be bloody quick, probably the quickest ground in Australia. It's, it's more like an English ground when it dries out and, it, you know, the English grounds are bloody quick. So my thinking was, apart from the fact that I thought the pitch would do a bit, also, I thought the outfield being heavy was going to probably cost England 30 runs in a day's play. Mm. And I thought if it's dry, then the next day, that's probably going to be worth another 30 to us. Mm. So you're talking about a 60-run swing here. So that was my reasoning, nothing to do with being brave or anything else other than purely cricketing reasons. Now, there's a lot going on in this test, isn't there? So, incredible match to be your first as captain. What did you make of the whole incident with Illingworth and Snow? Because obviously, Greg Chappell was at the crease with Dennis Lilly at that point. But did you seriously think that the match was going to get abandoned at any point? Well, it had been building up with Lou Rowan. Now, Lou, Lou, in my opinion, wasn't that good an umpire. I always said about Lou... He didn't get eight hours sleep at night. He had a couple of hours on while he was on the field. But he was also a copper and he was a very officious umpire. He was one of those umpires who wagged his finger at you. Yeah. And you start wagging your finger at guys like Dennis Silly and Jon Snow and you're not going to get far. You know, that's part of an umpire's job. You know, I, I played under Colin Egar a lot for South Australia and obviously for Australia. And Cole understood players... And, you know, and that's what the good umpires do. Dickie Bird, Charlie Elliott, Douglas Sanghue, 
Colin Ego, all the good umpires I played under, they all understood the players mm. and they knew how to handle them. You know, Dickie, Dickie was terrific with Dennis. He knew when the steam was building up inside Dennis, Dickie would say something funny and Dennis would laugh and that would sort of bring the situation down. Lou, no, he was a cop and he was in charge and mm. you, you were going to do what Lou told you to do and if you didn't, he was going to wag his finger at you. Well, Dennis and, and Snowy have got a bit in common apart from the fact that they're fast bowlers. So this had been building up with Snowy. And let's be frank, I mean, it wasn't a bloody bouncer. I mean, if TJ had stood there and played it, he would have played it somewhere between waist and chest height. But what he did, he ducked into it. And I mean, TJ had this thing about bouncers. I mean, TJ would walk into the New South Wales dressing room, for instance, after play when we're having a beer and he'd go over to Lenny Pascoe and he'd say, oh, Lenny, you're not going to bowl me any bounces, are you? And I used to say to him, you're a fuckwit, TJ. I mean, firstly, you're showing your hand and secondly, what do you think Lenny's going to... Lenny's going to bowl you more bloody bounces, you know? So TJ ducked into it. Firstly, to call it a bouncer was ridiculous and secondly, as far as I can remember, that was the first one in that over. So what the hell was he warning Snowy about? I read something today, actually. I don't know how I... It was on Crick Info, and yeah. it said something about Illy reflects on the 70-71 series. And he said he he was worried about Snowy because he, he knew how Snowy would react, and he was obviously worried that Snowy would react in such a way that it would cause even more trouble. And apparently, I didn't realise this, but apparently after... TJ was carted off and Dennis came in, apparently he bowled a bouncer first ball, which is what any fast bowler is going to do anyhow. Yeah. But apparently, no, he whirled around and said to Lou Rowan, that's a bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hadn't heard that story before until I read the thing today. But I mean, that's the sort of thing Dennis would have done. Dennis would have done exactly the same. Snowy was well within his rights to to bitch about being warned because that was ridiculous. So then we've got the situation where Greg said to Dennis, mate, we're staying out here. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. Rowan comes down. I can't remember whether he came down with the other umpire or whether he came on his own. But he came in the dressing room and he said to me, Ian, I'm going down the other end and I'm going to speak to Ray and tell him to take his team back onto the field. And if he doesn't, they'll forfeit the game. And I'm thinking, shit, I hope Ray doesn't go back because my first test, I'll take a win any way I can get it. So then Dennis and Greg are still there at Stumps. And Rodney comes to me the next morning. And Rodney said, mate, our fast bowler, if you tell him that TJ's fit to bat again and that he's going to go in straight away this morning and you come in at the fall of the next wicket, he'll believe it. And I said, Bull, mate, I said, you're winding me up. He said, no, no, he'll believe it. So I went to Dennis and I said, oh, look, mate, TJ's going to go in this morning and you come in at the fall of the next wicket. Oh, can you do that? Can you? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Dennis, Dennis goes out the nets and he's batting in the net. We had to go and drag him out of the nets. Otherwise, <laughs> he'd still be in the nets. We had to drag him out and say, mate, you, you've got to go in. We were bullshitting him. Yeah, that's, uh, that was what was going on um, behind the scenes, yeah. England went on to win that seventh test to secure a 2-0 series win, their first down under since 1954-55. It might have been more emphatic, but for Ian's efforts with the bat, he scored 452 runs at 37.66. He made his maiden Ashes century in the fifth test and then followed it up with another in the sixth test at his home ground, the Adelaide Oval. And then that seventh test where he became Australian cricket captain. Did Ian have a particular philosophy towards the captaincy? Well, one of the things, I remember Lynn Marks played for New South Wales and South Australia, one season for South Australia. And Marksy and I, he, play, he finished up playing for Glen Elk, so we, we spent a bit of time together. We roomed together. And I remember saying to him one day, because he'd played under Richie, and I said to him, what's the great thing about Richie's captaincy? And he said, oh, mate, Richie stands there in the gully 
looking cool as a cucumber and he said it doesn't matter what's going on rich just looks the same and he said it'll be none for 200 and rich will just still be standing there and suddenly he'll just say uh, you move here and you move there or oh, and you have a bowl and he said everybody in the new south wales side will say ah this is the move that's going to change the game and he said half the time it works because the people believe it's going to work the main thing is that Richie always looks like he's in control no matter what's happening. And that left a big impression on me. And I've always believed that you've got to keep your emotions level as a captain. Because yeah. if you get up quickly, they'll be up with you. But then if you get down, they'll come down with you. Richie was standing in the gully. I'm standing at first slip. And I might have been in my guts, I might have been churning like buggery, but I'm trying to make it look like, you know, I've got this situation under control. So that left a big impression on me. When I got the job, I thought, shit, this is a hell of a difficult job I've been given. And then I thought a bit more deeply about it. And I thought, well, hang on. We haven't won a test for, I think it was 10 tests. I thought, shit, you know, we haven't been winning under Bill. So if we don't win under me, they're just going to say, well, they couldn't win under Bill. Why are they going to win under Ian? And I thought to myself, you know, what i got to do is try and win a game as quickly as possible and then maybe they'll think I'm a genius. So I promptly lost the first two tests that I, <laughs> that I captained. But then the, the Lord's Test win was, was important because it sort of gave me a bit of confidence. But it was also, it was based on, it's always called Massey's match, but you've got to give Greg equal billing with his 100 and, and Bob 16 wickets. But to me, the watershed game was the oval. That's where I reckon we suddenly believed that we could beat anybody because it was a really hard-fought test over six days. There were fluctuations the whole time. To me, that was the watershed test match. My attitude to captaincy... Stemmed from a lot of areas. Obviously, the genes, for a start, Vic was an aggressive captain and he didn't give me much advice. But, you know, I heard him talk at, at family functions, talking to people and telling stories. And you didn't need to be Einstein to realise that he was an aggressive captain. In fact, it's amazing having read, like, on Top Down Under, reading Vic's chapter on his captaincy, and I read that more after I'd finished playing. And I'm reading it and I started chuckling to myself and thinking, ah, oh, that's where it came from, you know, because Vic didn't take shit from anybody. I remember one great story. He was captain against New South Wales. And, I mean, New South Wales had basically the test side. And Vic, with the South Australian team, you know, he had Clary Grimmett and himself and not many other test players probably. Anyhow, they're playing New South Wales and they bowled New South Wales out near stumps. And it's quite dark when South Australia are going into bat. And Vic was opening the batting with a guy called Slinger Nitsky, who was his mate. As they were walking out to bat, Vic said to Slinger, don't ask any questions, Slinger, just follow me, do what I do. And Vic started walking towards fine leg instead of towards the pitch. Tommy Andrews, I think, was the umpire. And Tommy yelled out, Vic, where are you going? And Vic said, I can hear you, Tom, but I can't see you. Where are you? You know, in those days, you could appeal against the light. Yeah. And I think they got the light after a couple of balls or something like that. But Vic uh, with Tiger O'Reilly in uh, South Africa, they were playing not a test match. Tiger was a pretty fiery Irishman, you know, and hated batsmen. They were having trouble bowling this side out and Tiger was just going through the motions. So Vic put him out on the boundary and he said to a couple of Tiger's mates in Fingleton and McCabe, a couple of other Catholics, he said every now and again, just walk past Tiger and say, are you playing in this game, Tiger? And, and yeah, they did that for an hour or so. And Vic eventually went to him and he said, would you like to have a bowl, Tiger? Tiger said, give me the fucking ball, you know. And he... <laughs> He bowled them out in five minutes. So when I read these stories, I thought to myself, shit, now I see where a lot of it's come from. Uh, you know, it's in the, in the genes. I was also lucky that my last year at school, I was 16. 
and took over the captaincy of the school team at the same, it was the same year, 58 9, that Richie became captain of Australia. So Richie's style of captaincy really appealed to me aggressive, enthusiastic, patting each other on the back. Well, you know, they didn't do much, but they, they would gather after they got a wicket, and, you know, there was this feeling of enthusiasm and enjoying each other's success. So that left a big impression on me. I played under Les Favell all my, all my cricket for South Australia. Les was a very aggressive captain, not such a good captain when things started to turn against him. He, because he was so aggressive, he wasn't so good at stopping the flow, but he was very good when he was attacking. So what I did when I got the captaincy, I got a bit of paper and I wrote down the three captains I'd played under, Les at test level, Simpson and Bill Laurie. And I wrote down all the things that I liked about their captaincy. And on the other side, I wrote down the things that I didn't like. So I tried not to do the things that I didn't like. I tried to do the things that I liked. And then I thought, you just got to put your stamp on the game. And it's interesting, Ashley Mallett did a book on me a few years ago. And he, he went around and he spoke to a lot of the other guys. And Ross Edwards said... He cited an example where we were playing Pakistan at the SCG. It was the game when uh, I think Max Walker got six for 15 and we bowled him out for about 100 yeah. when they were only chasing 150. I remember Roscoe came to me and he, he was the cover fielder and he said, this batsman's hit three balls to my left that have gone to the boundary. Should I move a bit to my left? And I said to him, mate, you're the cover fields. When you're the bloody expert there, you go where you think you need to be. And Roscoe walked off thinking, oh, shit, you know, the captain's obviously not very happy with me. And then he said, I thought about it later on, and I thought, shit, what he's doing, he's empowering me, you know. You're the cover expert. You go where you think you've got to be. He said suddenly that made me feel good that, you know, he's empowering me. And a, a lot of the guys that Rowdy spoke to said that they felt that I empowered them rather than telling them what to do. Mate, you're good enough to be here. You know, know how to do the job. Just go and do it. That was something that I just did. It wasn't something that I sort of planned to do. It was just, it was me, I guess. What about your motivation as well? You're a born winner and you want to win Ashes series and you want to win test matches against whoever you're playing. But is it also about a respect for the game? Because you don't want to be the captain who has a five-day board draw. You want to be the captain that has that respect for the game and wants it played in the right way. Well, a couple of things. When I was sitting watching cricket, whether it was as a kid growing up or whether it was as a player, and Les, and I think I... Les was a bit of an influence here. If the game sort of stopped for mm. five minutes, Les got the shits. He was, what the fuck's going on here, you know? So I think that had a bit of an influence on me. And I, if I'm sitting there and we're not keeping things moving, I'm starting to, you know, what, what the fuck's going on here? Mm. But then the way you play will send a pretty strong message to the players themselves. And the other thing that's really crucial is if you send out the message that you're trying to win from ball number one, you'll frighten the shit out of a lot of opposition captains. There's a lot of captains who are going out there, not so much now that, you know, you make up time and test matches finish pretty quickly anyhow. But then the draw was a, quite a substantial part of test cricket. There were a lot of test captains who the draw was important to them. Now, suddenly here you are, letting everybody know, your own team and the opposition, we're trying to win this game from ball number one. Now the opposition captain's thinking, Jesus Christ, he's taken the draw out of the game. Uh, yeah. This is a win or a loss. Fuck me, we might be on the losing side here. And it has an effect on the opposing captain. And the other thing that's crucial is that your best players are your most competitive players. If you make the game interesting for them, you'll get the best out of them. Because... As I found from my own experience, when you could see that the game was going to be a draw after three days, well, fuck me, you know, there's, you just go through the motion. But if the game, like a lot of people said to me during World Series cricket, oh, it must be soul-destroying playing in front of a couple of hundred people. And I said, no, mate, it's not. 
I said, I played a lot of Shield games, final days, where there's only a couple of hundred people in the ground. I said, it's not the crowd that gets me going, it's the contest that gets me going. So I don't need 40,000, 50,000 people in the ground. I don't give a shit how many people are there. If the contest's on, I'm into it. And I realised that the, the better players, that's, that's how they feel. And if you make it interesting for them, they'll be, they'll be well and truly involved. And the other thing is, I, people talk about playing for the crowd. I made a hundred for my mother and my grandmother. <laughs> I said to John Newcomb the other day, I was having lunch with Newt. And I just, out of the blue, I just said, Newt, who did you win the tournaments for? And he just said, me. It fucking shits me when people say, oh, you know, I got a hundred for my mother and my grandmother or my grandfather or, you know, maybe if someone's just died, yeah. then I can understand it. But it's bullshit. You get a hundred for yourself because that'll keep you in the team for three games. My attitude was that if we played cricket that we felt was good and was exciting for us, it was yeah. going to be exciting for the crowd. So yeah. I didn't have to think about, oh, we've got to do this for the crowd. We just had to play good cricket. And I can tell from, you know, the people who come up to me still today and say, oh, we loved the cricket when you were captain because you had a bunch of characters and we always knew that you were trying to win the game. Yeah, if you look at 72, go back to that, the Oval, that was probably the springboard then to have that successful series in 74, 75. You know, you got the belief of the players there. Would you say that was fair? Oh, yeah, that, no doubt that that Oval Test was the watershed one where yeah. we got the belief that, yeah, I mean, England were the best side around at that stage. They were probably on the wane, but they were still the best side around. And we fought them tooth and nail and, and won that game. And as I say, that was the watershed game. That was the one that convinced us that we could beat anybody. Greg rates that series as his number one Ashes series. Would you go for that one or maybe 74, 75? Well, 74, 5 was more satisfying, I guess, because we won. But when I think of the importance of the 72 series, both personally and team-wise, and the fact that it was two all and there were some really good games of cricket, a lot of good individual performances. Yeah, better than... It. From an excitement, tension point of view, yes, 72 mm. was better than 74-5. From a satisfaction point of view, obviously, when you've been part of a team that's lost the Ashes, to get the opportunity to captain a team that wins the Ashes back, uh, that's pretty satisfying. 1972 in England and 1974 to 75 in Australia were certainly the two pivotal Ashes series of Ian's career. In 72, he scored 334 runs at 33.4, including 118 in that crucial win at the Oval that levelled the series, even if it could not secure the Ashes. In putting on 201 with Greg, they became the first brothers to score centuries in the same test innings. In 74-5, Ian scored 387 runs at 35.18, including 90 at Brisbane, which set up a win in that first test and laid the foundation for the crushing 4-1 series victory that meant the Ashes were back in Australian hands for the first time since 1968. It was also the first time that Australia had won an Ashes series outright since 1964 under Bob Simpson. But Ian's tenure as captain was not to last much longer. You had the 75 World Cup, 75 Ashes, and then you were done. So why did you resign the captaincy? Mate, I, I was, that word that you just used, I was done, mm. mentally done. You know? And blokes, Alan Border, Clive Lloyd, captain for 10 years, I don't know how they do that. I was mentally gone after four years. Now, maybe Border and Lloyd weren't having the fights with the board. And I don't say that I didn't enjoy some of the fights, but... I didn't have any fights left in me. I remember walking, we were walking to the press conference at the Oval after the Oval test. And I mean, we'd been in the field for five days because, you know, we, we made England follow on. So for parts of five days, because it was a six day test, we'd been in the bloody field. And, you know, I was really knackered. And we're walking to the press conference with Fred Bennett, or I'm walking with him. And I said, mate, I'm going to resign the captaincy at the press. Oh, mate, mate, you're tired. I said, I know I'm fucking tired, Fred, but I'm done as well. And I've always said that there were two things 
I knew that whoever was captaining against the West Indies had to captain aggressively because the only way you were going to beat the West Indies, because having seen them in that World Cup final, I knew that they were a team on the rise and they were going to be tough. And I thought the only way to beat a good side is you've got to be aggressive. You can't sit back and wait for them to make mistakes. You've got to provoke mistakes. And I knew that I just wasn't in the right frame of mind for that. If we'd have had a six-month break, maybe I would have done one more series. Mm. But we didn't. And I knew that I wasn't the right bloke to captain Australia against the West Indies. So time to go. Following Australia's run to the inaugural World Cup final, Ian led the side in a four-match Ashes series, which it won 1-0. Ian was prolific with the bat, scoring 429 runs at 71.5, including 192 at the Oval. After stepping down as captain, Ian returned to the ranks and played under Greg in a 5-1 series victory against the West Indies back in Australia. He retired from first-class cricket at the end of the season, but Kerry Packer at World Series Cricket would soon come knocking. Looking back, are you... What are you feeling? Are you proud that you actually made that move with Kerry Packer because of the benefits it brought the players? Is it tinged with any regret? What are your feelings? Well, that's the only reason why I played, because I'd retired. I'd been out of first class and international cricket for, for 12 months. The only reason I agreed to play was because I agreed with the principle that you know the players should have better pay and better conditions. Yeah, I mean, it's the toughest cricket I ever played. Probably the thing that I'm most proud of is a couple of things are important here. There was 50-odd cricketers signed originally. So it wasn't just an Australian problem. There were a lot of other cricketers around the world who were pissed off. And I know England in 70-71, if you go back to that, they were really pissed off about the extra test because they weren't asked about it. They weren't offered any money. I know Snowy was really pissed off about it. And as I say, 50 odd guys. And the fact that it stayed secret for so long is an indication of how pissed off the players were. Because generally you tell a cricketer something and you <laughs> might as well announce it on the radio. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of what World Series cricket did, what we achieved. From a financial point of view, it swung 180 degrees. If you didn't like what they were offering, you didn't have any other alternatives. Well, I suppose you could go play county cricket, but you really... You really needed to be playing test cricket to get a decent county contract. Now, if you're not happy with what the board offers you for a test match, you can tell them to shove it and go play T20 in a whole lot of places. So I don't know that the administrators really thought about how they they were putting so much power in the players' hands. But, you know, I mean, the programming and stuff like that, it's bloody ridiculous the scheduling. Uh, I'm not sure how much say the players have got in, in things like that. I've said a million times, I'm bloody glad I played when I did and not now. I wouldn't last five minutes now. I'd be telling some prick to get stuffed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the last tests you played against England weren't actually for the Ashes, but the, in 1980, where there was that three-match non-Ashes series. But were you glad to have one more crack at, at the Poms? Well, I played the last season for the wrong reasons. I signed for three years with World Series Cricket, which took me up to 79-80. When the compromise occurred, I was quite happy. That was it. But then I was told by, I think it came from Kerry, that the young players would need someone to fight their fights for them because the board would probably uh, discriminate against them. I really didn't want to play. We'd had, had that riot in Guyana and I... That was it for me. Mm-hmm. I was done again. Anyhow, I thought, all right, I've, you know, and, and I've always said retirement is one selfish decision. You make it for only one person, whatever you want to do. Unfortunately, on that occasion, I didn't. After the first day of Shield Cricket, I, I got reported and I rang Richie from Devonport in Tasmania and I said, Richie, I don't know who's trying to get me the captaincy, but tell him stop immediately because I'm, I'm done, I'm not. And the board then suspended me for three weeks, which was done on purpose mm. to take it past the first test. And then I got, Greg was the beneficiary of some of my anger. They didn't have a number three at that stage. 
And I said, and I just made a hundred in a shield game. And I said to Greg, when are those fucking idiots going to pick me? They need a number three. When they, when are they, he said, well, get some runs and they'll pick you. I said, in case you haven't noticed, I just fucking got a hundred. And then they picked me in the one day side. How fucking stupid was that? And then we played the West Indies at the SCG and Greg came to me before the game. We, we were batting and he said, oh, if we lose an early wicket, you're in number three. If we get a start, you'll come in number six. And I said, fuck you, mate. I said, I'm either number three or I'm number six. I said, I'm not fucking, I'm not protecting these pricks. You make up your mind. Am I three or am I six? And he said, oh, you, you can go in at six. <laughs> and I got, in fact, I might have got the man of the match, I think. I got 60 odd, not out. And we beat the West Indies. And I got 60 odd, I think, against England. I think I was not out with that one as well. So I wasn't in a great, uh, I wasn't in a great mood. I, I should never have played that season. I don't know that I was over the moon about having a final crack against England. But I mean, once you're there and you're playing against England, you, you're going to compete. What was it like playing under Greg? Was that weird or did that feel quite normal? No, I mean, it, yeah, it was quite normal. Um, I said to him when he got the captaincy, uh, I said, mate, I'm not going to be coming telling you things. I mm. said, you know where I am if you, if you want to know anything, just mm. come and ask, but I won't be telling you things. I think the only time I said something to him without being asked was in Perth when Fredo got the 160, yeah. And I said, mate, it's, it's good to attack and it's best to attack, but there's every now and again you've got to pull back. And I said, don't be embarrassed or frightened to pull back. Sometimes you do need to do it. Don't think that you've just got to be all out attack the whole time. That was the only thing I ever told him. Uh, We've said between 72 and 74, 75 was the best series. What was the oval 72, the best individual Ashes match you played in? It's the best cricket match I played in. The, the only one that sort of came close was uh, Trinidad in 72-3. They needed 66 with five in hand at lunch on the last day, and we won by 44. We had another great game with the West Indies during World Series cricket, also in Trinidad, where we won by 20 runs. They're the three best test matches I've played in. But because of the importance, I think I'd go for the Oval, number one. Best Ashes century? Mine. Yeah. Probably the Oval. My most important innings, not my best, but my most important innings in any but it's an Ashes game, was the 56 at Lords. If you want to know why, read Jack Bannister's book, uh, Innings of My Life. He does Greg and I together, and we both pick Lords 72. He's got a great finishing line. He said, if I had to pick between the two, who would I pick? He said, I'd pick Ian to play for my life, but he said, only if Ian thinks my life's worth it. Who was the best English bowler you played against? John Snow and Andy Roberts are the two best opposition quickies I played against. Hard to split them, but Snowy, Snowy was a terrific bowler. I've always said I was a bloody dunce or we were dunces. We should have worn a blue cap or a red cap because he hated those bloody baggy <laughs> green things. <laughs> you know, he was a terrific, terrific competitor, Snowy. Who was the English captain that you respected the most? Oh, Ray Illingworth. I learnt, I learnt quite a bit about captaincy for Millie. 72 was, you know, we've talked about what a good series it was. And a big part of that was Illy always wanted to have a game of cricket. But I learned a lot about captaincy from Illy. What did playing in the Ashes mean to you? Same as playing any other test match, really. It was a game to be won. From a recognition point of view, that's where it was more important. Because if you did well in an Ashes series... As an Australian cricketer, you got greater recognition. But I approached every test match with the same fervour, whatever you want to call it. It was a match to be won. And many matches did he win through his skill, drive, aggression and never-say-die attitude. When he took on the captaincy in 1971, Australia was down and out. Literally, in the case of Terry Jenner, when he was felled by that Jon Snow bouncer, the Ashes were in England's hands. But by the time his glorious reign was over in 1975, Australia was standing tall once more. The swagger was back. 
and Captain Chapelli signed off with customary style and panache at the Oval, leading from the front with his highest ashes score of 192 and the urn safely tucked in his back pocket. Many thanks to Ian for those superb memories, for his forthright opinions and above all, for his honesty. I'm sure you'll agree that an hour with Ian Chapel is never time wasted. Time to sign off. With your blessing, I'll keep on the trail of our one Ashes Test Wonders, as well as a few superstars along the way. Stay tuned for plenty more Ashes Tales of Yore. Until then, I've been Graham Barrett, and this has been Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. Ashes.